So, here's a medical specialty we talked about earlier in the semester. I don't know if you remember the pronunciation of this. Otorhinolaryngology. Um, when we first had this, you didn't know all the words. Now you can probably look at it and go, oh yeah, I understand this. Ear, nose, throat, logi. So the study of the ears, the nose, and the throat. Uh, so pardon me, otorhinolaryngologist is another word for an ENT. An ENT is generally what we call this type of practice, ear, nose, and throat doctor. And an otorhinolaryngologist, what a great word, right? They are a specialist in the study of the ears, the nose, and the throat. Um, also known as an otorhinolaryngologist. We can't get enough times on this, so there you have it. At least three times in a row. Have fun with that one if you want to pronounce it three times fast. Uh, one of the subspecialties that happens uh, at ENT offices is audiology, and this is a study of hearing. So soundproof booth, headphones, send signals at different frequencies and volumes, and the person hits a button to indicate uh, when they can hear the sound. Person who performs this function is an audiologist. They're a specialist in the evaluation of hearing loss. I guess if you had to put an equivalency on it to what we talked about earlier about the eyes, the auto audiologist would sort of be the uh, optometrist of the audio world, if you will. And speaking of audio, that's a combining form that means hearing. Audiometry is the process of measuring hearing, as we just discussed, and the device that we use to measure it is called an audiometer. It's an instrument used to test hearing. We have another combining form for audio, audito, which also means hearing, and that ties into the word auditory, which means pertaining to the sense of hearing. And here you see a depiction of one of the first cell phones as they were being developed. They, you probably don't know this, but they started out as tin cans and string in their inception. Just kidding. Anyway, most I don't know if kids do this kind of stuff anymore because they all have a cell phone, so why would they bother with string in a can? Um, but there was a time when kids would do this, and if you try it, it actually works out pretty well. Tie a string, you know, poke a hole in the bottom of a tin can, tie a knot in the string, do the same on the other end, stretch it tight and speak into it, and it will transmit sound. So the sound waves will pick up on the string, they'll vibrate. It won't be super clear, but it does transmit sound to a certain degree. We also have the term acuso, which means sound or hearing, as in acoustic meaning pertaining to the sound or the sense of hearing. We see a depiction down here of sound moving as a wave. That top layer right there would most likely be treble. Treble has very, very short frequency, uh, and uh, it travels it, it travels, uh, it travels a long distance, but not as much as bass. You see bass has a much larger sine wave here on the bottom that's depicted with those big waves on the bottom. So if you're in traffic and someone has their you know, car stereo really loud, you can often hear the bass, but normally you can't hear the treble, the upper sounds, because that bass really carries. So um, yeah, treble needs a little bit more space in order to move through, but bass will penetrate all kinds of stuff. And that's once again why you hear it so frequently on really loud stereos. Now we have the term Odo for ear. And I guess that's the one term in otorhinolaryngologist that you may not have known, although I do think we covered it earlier, but don't recall, doesn't matter. Here's a list of words tied into Odo. As in Odic, pertaining to the ear. Oditis is inflammation of the ear. Odorrhea is a discharge from the ear. Otalgia is ear pain or an earache. Otoplasty is surgical repair of the ear. An otoscope is the instrument for examining the ear. And otoscopy is a visual examination of the ear. Once again, there's the Y, so think procedure. And it is the external auditory canal and the eardrum that you're visualizing when you use an otoscope. And otitis media. So that term, media, is referring to middle ear. And when we use it with otitis, which would be inflammation, uh, it's, we're talking about the inflammation of the inner ear. Uh, and usually it usually follows an infection. And honestly, that's a good way of putting it. It usually is the indication of an infection, to be, be the way I would phrase it. Um, so if you look in these two depictions here, when we use an otoscope, and it is something that medical assistants such as myself will do in practice, we'll actually go in there and look around and potentially re remove things if we need to. It falls within our, our scope, so we often will do this for physicians. And when we look down with that otoscope down the ear canal, we see uh, what you see depicted here in these pictures. There's a normal eardrum on the left, and then you see the otitis media, or in other words, a middle ear infection on the right. And so these are very clear distinctions. You can clearly see 
that the one on the right has some pathology going on because of all the red tissue. And what the other part you were looking at there, of course, was the tympanic membrane, which is our medical term for the eardrum. And there are two combining forms that apply, uh, moringo, or moringo and tympano. And the moringo is how I pronounce it, but I have heard moringo. So I'm just throwing it out there. You may hear people pronounce these different ways. Either way, they're talking about the tympanic membrane. This is another one of these situations where we have mix and match with the combining form. So either is appropriate. You could have meringitis or tympanitis. Either way, be inflammation of the eardrum. You could have a meringotomy or a tympanotomy. In either way, that would be incision of the tympanic membrane. You could have meringoplasty or tympanoplasty, and these would be surgical repair of the tympanic membrane. And on it goes. So you can just keep adding suffixes and uh, come up with all kinds of compound words. And just keep in mind, tympanic membrane is the medical term for eardrum. So here's a meringotomy, we we'll talk about a little bit more in detail. Incision of the eardrum to relieve pressure and release pressure's serous fluid built up in the middle ear. So we have otitis media going on, and there's a lot of pressure and fluid in there. They need to drain it. This could be chronic. This could be acute. So it might be something, you, your third ear infection of the year, and then they want to drain it. Some folks live with chronic ear infections, and so they were going to place what are called PE tubes, and that's what you see illustrated here. Um, and so those are pressure equalizing tubes. They serve the same sort of function that I mentioned earlier regarding eustachian tubes, but um, they have an additional function of helping the ear uh, drain fluid from the middle ear right behind the tympanic membrane. So that gives two drainage points, eustachian tubes and through the PE tubes. Um, so in these cases, as I said, repeated ear infections don't respond to antibiotics or there's a chronic condition that requires a constant draining of the ear they'll put PE tubes in, they can be taken out when necessary. And the beautiful thing about an eardrum, even if you should happen to rupture an eardrum, they will repair themselves usually quite effectively unless there's extensive damage. So when PE tubes come out, it's not a huge thing to be able to uh, see that eardrum or tympanic membrane heal and become normal again. Of course, anything that affects hearing we call hearing loss. It means a decreased ability to perceive sounds and in comparison to what we consider to be normal. So one of the major reasons that we have hearing loss, and this would be uh, what we would call conductive hearing loss, would be too much earwax or cerumen in the ear. Now this also falls into the scope of medical assistance. I mentioned earlier removing things from the ear. And one of the things that we get to do, uh, or at least I used to when I was in practice, is remove earwax. There's a couple different ways of doing it. The way you see it depicted here is usually not the way it's done. And so we almost never go in there with a curette and drag it out. We have a different technique and we'll show you in a moment. But before we do, I want to just tell you about conductive hearing loss. This is a treatable type of hearing loss. It's prevented or that prevents it. Let me rephrase that. Something is preventing sound from reaching the ear. It's usually an obstruction in the ear canal. Very often it is cerumen. And, or there could be damage to the eardrum or ossicles. The causes can be a perforated eardrum, ear infection, foreign bodies, fluid in the ear, and earwax. So once again, conductive hearing loss. This is not permanent, it's repairable. Usually, as we said, a perforated eardrum, which is a ruptured eardrum, um, infection, as I said, or any type of foreign body that's stuck in the auditory canal can cause conductive hearing loss. Our method of removing things, usually cerumen, this is our primary method for removing that, is called the lavage. In this case, it would be an otolavage. And lavage means to wash out or irrigate a hollow body cavity or an organ. So you can have, and maybe you've heard of people having their stomach pumped, that's a gastro lavage. You can have a colo lavage, so a lavage of the colon to remove anything. Uh, in this case, it's otolavage. Anyway, the takeaway is the lavage is this washing out a hollow organ to remove something that usually is not supposed to be there or it's there and it won't go away on its own so we're there to help it out another form of hearing loss is a little bit more serious this is sensorineural hearing loss this is hearing loss caused by damage to the inner ear or the nerves to the brain so this is neurological damage this is not the matter of some tissue being able to heal after it perforates or something like that this is a more serious condition Sound is typically conducted normally through external in the middle ear, but in this case, the neurological connection to the brain has a deficit and it's not functioning. 
So this might be the result of aging. Uh, it could be illness or tumors. It could be head trauma. Noise exposure, in my case, I have central nearing, neural hearing loss and mine's to noise exposure because of all those years of traveling as a musician in a rock band and standing in front of very loud drum kits and guitar amplifiers every night. My ears now ring at about 1K at that frequency constantly and it never goes away. Those of you who use um, earbuds, very, very loud, will probably experience the same sort of thing someday. So be careful with those. Those can actually damage your hearing. So there's some noise exposure ideas that might cause central neuro, neuro hearing loss. Also, there are certain drugs, especially antibiotics, that can cause this type of hearing loss. So when you get those long brochures from the pharmacist and some of us never read them, it's a good idea to look them, look at them. You'll find there's a lot of antibiotics, especially for respiratory infections, that can have a side effect of permanent neurological hearing loss. In other words, sensor neuro hearing loss. So it's always a good idea to read those things so you understand the risks. Of course, medicine is always a risk benefit. And so sometimes there's a risk, almost always. Uh, but is the benefit greater than the risk? And usually it is, or we wouldn't advise it. Not always. And just one last thing, Meniere's disease, which if you don't know what it is, you can look up. Meniere's disease is a, sort of a complex of things going on within the inner ear, and that will also lead to sensor neuro hearing loss in certain cases. A Ryan and Weber test is one way to test to see if it's central neural versus conductive hearing loss. So this is hearing acuity. They have vibrating pitchfork. You don't see this done much anymore. Uh, you, and this is how they differentiate between the two. If they hit the pitchfork and they touch it to the mastoid bone behind your ear on top of your head and you can hear it, you have conductive hearing loss. Something's blocking transmission. If they do the same procedure and you can't hear it through the tuning forks in the skull or in the mastoid bone behind the ear, then it's nerve damage. And that's an old antiquated way of deciphering between the two. Some doctors still use it and it's effective. Presbycusis, this is the hearing loss due to aging. And I am going to speed up a little bit here because we only have a few minutes left and just a couple of slides and I want to get them all on. So we'll just run, kind of run through these last few words. Once again, presbycusis, hearing loss due to aging. Anacusis is total deafness. So here, nothing is working. And there are ways of getting around it. A cochlear implant for some people works well. This is an electronic transmitter that's surgically implanted into the cochlea of a deaf person to restore hearing. So there's a component that, that is inside of the ear, and then you see this contraption. And in the picture here, this is an older, antiquated system. You can see there's almost a mic what looks like a microphone, and it's sitting right in the ear. Or it kind of looks like a hearing aid. And that picks up sound, transmits it through this device, and then tries to get it through the inner ear. Um, it, it's done through vibrations. That's one form of cochlear implant. Uh, then we have photophobia, which we already talked about. That's abnormal sensitivity to light. There's an equivalent for sound. It's called phonophobia. It's an abnormal sensitivity to sound. So just like we mentioned with photophobia, certain sounds will be intolerable for this person and, and could be the result of the same things we talked about earlier. Could be migraines or lots of sound exposure or, you know, lots of reasons for it. Uh, just be familiar with these two words. They will be on your exam this week. Vertigo. It's a great movie by Alfred Hitchcock, if you've never seen it. And in its own sense, it is a sensation of moving around in space or a feeling of spinning. It results from the cochlea that we talked about earlier in the inner ear. There are small stones and they're called otoliths and they drift around in fluid. They touch certain nerve endings and that tells us which way is up. Sometimes one of those rocks will get stuck in a way that it's, it's triggering the, uh, the nerve that it's, that it's near and it starts a spinning sensation. Sometimes cases of vertigo can last for days, actually hours, days, weeks, months, or even years. I've seen people have had it for a long, long time. They often look like they um, may be intoxicated because it affects their balance, but usually it's just vertigo. It can be a tough one to fix, uh, and it's definitely something that needs a doctor's attention. Tinnitus, or tinnitus, however you want to pronounce it. I described earlier I have my own hearing loss, and mine is ringing noise that's heard in one or both ears. It's constant. Even in quiet environments, it never goes away. And these things are, once again, causes injury, disease process, toxic levels of medications can cause it also. Here's some abbreviations. I'm going to let you read those over yourself. This concludes our final lecture of the semester. Congratulations, you did it. We got through all of them. Next, we're going to start studying for the final exam. So be ready for that. Hope you're all doing well, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you.